Welcome to today's webinar, Hashtag Charter 40, a chance to mark the 40th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. My name is Andrew Cardozo, I'm president of the Pearson Centre and delighted to welcome you to this session. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. We thank them for their welcome and wisdom, and we welcome our other panelists and our audience from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Canadian, the, the Pearson Centre um, was established nine years ago. We're a progressive think tank. We bring together people from all political parties, business, labour, civil society, and others who are interested in political discussions and policy discussions. Um, we, we address the challenging economic, social, and global issues of the day. As we like to say, we bring together people and ideas. Today's webinar follows one of our key priority areas, namely pursuing justice. And I'll just mention it's one that started with the help of Irwin Kotler, a former Attorney General and Minister of Justice for Canada, who has joined us in the audience today. A special thank you to all our donors and sponsors, uh, with many of you who are with us today. You make these sessions possible. I, I want to quickly mention that later on this month in April, from the 10th to the 19th, we have a series of webinars, which we're calling our conference on new challenges for the Canada we want. There will be 10 webinars over the course of three weeks. Please join us for that and all the information will be on our website. Now, just briefly on the format, we will hear from our, our, our panelists for about uh, 45 minutes, um, and then we'll take questions from you, the audience. So please send in your questions on the question box. And we have a very accomplished panel today, but I will keep my introduction short so that we can hear from them. Professor Charisma Mathen is a leading Canadian constitutional expert, a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. She's an award-winning uh, award author. Her books include Courts Without Cases and The Tenth Justice. She's a regular commentator on news channels as she makes complex legal issues understandable to the rest of us non-legal scholars. Jessica Law Thompson is a senior human rights lawyer. She has been director of the Yukon Human Rights Commission for several years and, and, and pointed for today and the events in the world today. She is also a member of the Ukrainian Canadian Bar Association. They have worked internationally for the OSCE Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, as well as the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Um, sorry. Catherine McKenney is an Ottawa City Councillor, first elected in 2014. They have a reputation of being one of the strongest advocates on City Council, for affordable housing, childcare, human rights, and a healthy city. And notably, they are now a declared candidate for the mayor of Ottawa in this fall's election. Uh, Laurie Idlout is a lawyer and member of parliament for Nunavut. She is the NDP critic for Crown Indigenous Relations, Indigenous Services, and Northern Affairs. Prior to being elected in 2021, she was a practicing lawyer in a Calorit, and was executive director of the Nunavut Embrace Life Council, a nonprofit organization committed to suicide prevention. Um, I expect to be joined by Yasser Nakvi, uh, who's also a lawyer and a member of parliament. He's, he's the MP for Ottawa Centre and parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Previously, he was a member of provincial parliament of Ontario and where he served as attorney general uh, for the province. So we're going to start um, with uh, our panelists telling us a bit of picking a section of the charter that they're going to tell us about. So they've each got about three minutes. They're going to introduce themselves again. And the reason we're doing that is that we will post uh, this webinar in its entirety, but also uh, post this, the segments from each one of our panelists telling us about the sections that, uh, that they've chosen. Um, so I will start with uh, Professor uh, Mathen. You will be you will start, and I believe you're going to read uh, section one. So let's we'll start with you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and it's a, a real pleasure to be on this panel. 
So section one reads, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So leave it to a law prof to pick the one section that doesn't appear to state a particular right or freedom, but uh, is more about process. Uh, in fact, section one is incredibly important. The first thing that it does is it reiterates that the charter does guarantee a number of rights and freedoms, but also it makes clear that all of the rights and freedoms are subject to reasonable limits. Now, the fact that rights would be subject to limits might seem strange, but actually when you look at constitutions, it's quite rare for rights to be framed in absolute terms. Even the American Constitution, which has nothing like Section 1, uh, does not include many absolute rights, but the limits tend to be articulated by courts right by right in, in particular cases, and they can vary quite dramatically. Section 1 applies to every right and freedom in the Charter. Now, the concern you might have about a section like um, Section 1 is that it appears to undermine what it means to recognize something as a right. Because if you read it in a particular way, it suggests that rights can be limited, perhaps if a large enough majority in society want them to be. And sometimes we refer to this as the tyranny of the majority. One of the risks of democracy is that minorities can be vulnerable if they lack political power, if they are unpopular, or even if they are the object of state animus or dislike. Section one does not operate that way. For something to be a reasonable limit, it's not enough that a majority or even a supermajority really, really wants that limit to be in place. This is because the limits in section one must be consistent with a free and democratic society, which is the core of the Canadian political community. So section one exists not as an exception to rights based on majority preference, but as a confirmation that rights are an essential element of democracy. So a free and democratic society has respect for the inherent dignity of human beings, is committed to social justice and equality, accommodates a wide variety of beliefs, respects cultural and group identity, and maintains faith in social and political institutions which enhance the participation of individuals and groups in society. And all of those points I've just read are taken verbatim from an early Supreme Court of Canada decision which articulated the approach to Section 1. So Section 1, in a sense, is really the core of the Charter hmm. because at the same time as it recognizes that in a free and democratic society, rights are not absolute, they nonetheless must, must be consistent with the very values that lie at the heart of what that society stands for. Thank you, Professor Mathen. Uh, Jessica Law Thompson, over to you. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's uh, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to to be here with you and celebrate 40 years, four decades of of the charter and its development in Canada. Um, and I'm grateful to join you from Te Stage, Denman Island, a small island in the Salish Sea, which is the unceded territory of Comox First Nation, Pentlash, Slayama, and Hulkamenam and Coast Salish peoples. So today, um, I was asked to to pick a section of the charter to talk about um, and to try to read it in Ukrainian. Um, I am a Ukrainian Canadian and I'm also here, as Andrew said, um, on behalf of the Ukrainian Canadian Bar Association. But like many Ukrainian Canadians um, who came over the waves of immigration, my Ukrainian is not very strong. It's a kitchen, kitchen Ukrainian. So I'll do my best, so please bear with me. Uh, Section three, democratic rights. Demokratichni prava. Tre. Kožen Romandianin Kanadi, Maji Pravo, Obirati Chleniv, Palati Roma Tazakono, Davchoi, Assembleis, Voyei Provinci, 
a takož buďte kandidátom u deputáty s kým predstavníc Orchaniv. In English, Democratic Rights, Section 3. Every Canadian citizen has the right to elect members of the House of Commons and the Legislative Assembly of their province, as well as to be a candidate for those representative bodies. This section of the Charter didn't have a similar provision in the earlier Bill of Rights. Um, and, and it's unique in that it's a section that only applies to citizens, which is, is unique in the Charter as most of it applies to, uh, to non-citizens as well. But similar provisions to, to Section 3 are found in international instruments that are binding on Canada, such as Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And in the many years since 1982, the Supreme Court of Canada has further defined the meaning of Section 3 to include the right of each citizen to play a meaningful role in the electoral process. And it's affirmed how participation in the electoral process has an intrinsic value. It's independent, independent of its actual outcome on elections. The denial of a right to vote affects one's dignity, one's self-worth, those core concepts that lie at the heart of uh, human rights law around the world. There is an interrelationship between Section 3 and other charter rights, particularly the right to freedom of expression in 2B and equality rights. I think we are all seeing uh, more and more every day how democracy is a precious thing. Its possibilities take the shape of awe and wonder. There's something to fight for. And we all together share responsibility for our lived rights and freedoms in a country like Canada. The need to uphold and defend human rights and universal freedoms is no less urgent today than it has been over the previous decades. Democracy is lived. It's a gift that cannot be bestowed. Only built, dreamed, shared, taught, and celebrated through the myriad actions of people. In a thriving democracy, each generation is called upon to weave its own unique threads into the tapestries that bind us together. Those of shared human values, such as peace, dignity, and compassion. So that's what section three means to me. Um, and I think it it is a time when many of us in democracies around the world are understanding uh, the value and the importance and the fragility and preciousness of our dem democracies uh, in a new way um, as we see what is happening in Europe. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica Law Thompson. Uh, welcome, Yasser Nakli. We will come to you in a few minutes. Um, I, I know that you signed on yesterday, so if you've got the chance to uh, highlight one section, we'll come to you in a, in a few minutes. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Councillor McKinney. Please go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's great to be here. I come from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Um, I'm going to I'm going to preface uh, by saying that I'm neither a lawyer nor a constitutional expert. Um, and probably for that very reason, um, I chose Section 28. Um, Section 28 reads, uh, notwithstanding anything in this charter, the rights and freedoms referred to in it are guaranteed equally to male and female persons. Um, so as a trans uh, non-binary person um, myself, that statement, of course, uh, leaves, leaves me out as well as you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of Canadians. And while uh, people often think that Section 15, um, which offers uh, equal protection, uh, quote unquote, with, without discrimination based on race, uh, national or ethnic origin, color, uh, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability would, would cover us, um, it, it doesn't, sex and, and gender, um, as, as we all know, uh, are not the same. And um, 
I often, when I'm asked to explain, I, 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 I say it, you have to think of it as, as a computer. Um, if, if we were all computers, uh, sex would be the hardware uh, we're born with, but gender is the software that, that makes us function. Um, and while some of us use uh, the, the men operating systems and uh, some use the women operating systems, um, uh, you know, others of us uh, use neither um, or use uh, traits of, of both. Um, more like Unix than say Apple or Macintosh. I want to simplify it even even further. Um, well, you know, I think I think it's important to recognize that um, that that um, non-binary has been recognized by many cultures and societies, um, documented as far back really as you know uh, 400 BC in some in some texts. As, as a third gender, uh, the authors of the charter uh, didn't consider the implication of, of this wording. So uh, for myself and other trans uh, non-binary persons, um, am I protected as neither male nor, nor female? And uh, thankfully, uh, Bill C-16, that we're probably all uh, well uh, aware of, uh, which was an act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code, uh, which was adopted by Parliament in 2016, uh, brought gender identity and expression as protected grounds under um, the uh, Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code. Um, it still it still is not covered in in uh, section uh, 28 of the charter, and I'll just end by saying that you know um, why is this important? Uh, yesterday was the International Transgender Day of Visibility, um, and um, as I often do, I, I use my space uh, to make space safer for others. Uh, try to, and um, I always uh, take advantage and, and and post things on social media. And yesterday, I uh, I did just that, and while I had overwhelming positive response, and, and it really was overwhelming, it was still my feed was still filled with um, quite a bit of misunderstanding and, and hatred and, and some threats. So. Uh, it really, uh, you know, it really does um, remind us why we must uh, entrench uh, protections for gender diverse Canadians in in um, our laws and our charter, and continue to um, educate all Canadians about their importance. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKenney. Uh, Laurie Edloud, I'll ask you to present your section, your chosen section. I just wanted to first thank you warmly uh, for the welcome. Uh, I I was I'm honored to be part of this discussion. Uh, talking about rights is very close to my heart, so I'm glad to be part of uh, talking about individual people's rights. Uh, today I'll be speaking about Section 35. I think predict predictably as an Inuk lawyer, uh, Section 35 is quite important to me because uh, it speaks to the rights of uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada, as well as recognizing the existing Indigenous and treaty rights. So I'll read Section 35. Uh, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. In this act, Aboriginal peoples of Canada includes the Indian, Inuit and Métis peoples of Canada. For greater certainty, in subsection 1, treaty rights includes rights that now exist by way of land claims agreements or may be so acquired. And finally, Notwithstanding any other provision of this act, the Aboriginal and treaty rights, the rights referred to in subsection one, are guaranteed equally to male and female persons. Uh, I, I'm particularly 
uh, excited, I think, today to speak, especially in light of um, Pope Francis's apology to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, with the atrocities that we were uh, forced to experience uh, from the church. I, I think that uh, reconciliation uh, is going to be quite inform uh, in important. Uh, I, I know that uh, in the mainstream society, there's been a huge uh, effort to separate church from the state. But when it comes to First Nations, Métis and Inuit, uh, both state and church have done atrocious um, uh, damage to our peoples. And I think that today's apology, I think, is quite uh, timely in today's discussion. Um, I, I wanted as well just to speak about Indigenous and treaty rights that are guaranteed under Section 35 of the Constitution are laws that contain present and future promises to respect and uh, honor Indigenous rights. Uh, indigenous people are all across Canada must have the right to care for our lands, territories, waters, and other natural resources for the benefit of future generations. And that to me is what real reconciliation looks like. Uh, future generations must be able to enjoy the beautiful land that we've lived on since time immemorial. And that is why Section 35 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is so important to me. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. Like, might I say we are uh, equally honored that you've joined us today, uh, the first time you joined us at the Pearson podium since your election last fall, and I hope there'll be many more occasions. Yasser um, Nakli, uh, I did a, a very warm welcome to you earlier, which I won't repeat now, so uh, please go ahead and and uh, tell us about the section you want to Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And um, as you can see by my backdrop, I'm joining you from, from the House of uh, Commons. Uh, which is uh, located on the unceded uh, territory of the uh, Algonquin Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, um, this is such an interesting and fascinating discussion, and I'm just going to pick from what I've heard so far from Catherine, from Lori, um, as to the section that I have chosen. And if you permit me, I will also choose, highlight a section that I dislike the most in Charter as well. Um, not just things that uh, we all love about the Charter. The, the section that is very little known and spoken about that I often refer to and, and highlight is Section 27 uh, of the Charter, which is under the heading Multicultural Heritage. And the section reads as follows. This Charter shall be interpreted in a manner consistent with the preservation and enhancement of the multicultural heritage of Canadians. Um, people are quite surprised when I mention to them that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that was written in 1982 actually talks, talks about the multicultural nature and aspect of Canada and Canadians and inclusion, of course, including, uh, um, as Laurie pointed out, Indigenous peoples and the fact that we have treaty rights and treaty obligations. And this section hasn't been used much, uh, but it's it's it kind of gives one of the guiding principles around how the charter should be interpreted uh, when the courts are looking at it or uh, public decision makers are making decisions, whereby uh, one, it requires that by using the term shall, that the charter must always be interpreted in a manner consistent with Canada's multicultural uh, 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 heritage. But in addition to that, it also says that it should be consistent with the preservation and enhancement of multicultural heritage of Canadians. So there's a, there's a in my view, a positive obligation um, on the part of interpreters when they're looking at the charter and applying the charter in terms of enhancing, not just preserve the status quo, but actually enhance as a positive obligation, the multicultural heritage of, of Canadians. Um, I think that's it's a, it's a quite a remarkable uh, use of language that was written 40 years ago, uh, which is even more um, 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 applicable 
to the kind of Canada we have and the kind of Canada we we are building. So I'm always um, intrigued by this section. I always try to highlight it. It's a very simple uh, section, uh, very little use. It's some some case law, not uh, and the scholars within us will can speak to the effectiveness uh, of this uh, of this particular provision. But I just like the simplicity and the symbolic nature of it. If I may very quickly tell you the section that I like the least and the section that hopefully as a parliamentarian uh, with help of others, I get to uh, hopefully limit or even eliminate is the notwithstanding clause is section 33 uh, of the charter. You know, in, in the kind of democracy and the pluralistic modern society that we live in Canada today, uh, as a um, largely due to as a result of the charter over the 40 years, the fact that we have a provision that gives majority of, of parliamentarians, whether it's in the House of Commons or in a provincial or territorial legislature, uh, to take away rights of people that are enshrined under this charter by simple majority is unacceptable. Uh, uh, to me, I fully recognize that it was a political compromise uh, that was uh, that resulted in Section 33 of the Charter to so that we can have a charter, and I think I think we should not undermine that political compromise. And we all know the stories, and we've all read the history books as to how that all came about. Uh, but I just feel that uh, time has come uh, in the kind of Canada we live in that we don't need Section 33. We've got such rich jurisprudence. We have Section One of the Charter that allows for uh, reasonable limits in a free and democratic society on certain certain rights, uh, but it has to be justified. It, there's a very stringent test that associated. But you know these these there are uh, there there are a mechanism by which we can put limits. But to take away rights for a five year period by a simple majority, uh, that which basically was Section 33 permits, as we are seeing seeing playing played out by way of Bill 21 in Quebec is a very black and white clear example of the uh, very uh, uh, unreasonable in my view use of section 33 is of concern and I'm hopeful and I'm starting to talk to people and uh, public forums like uh, at the, the Pearson podium here at you that as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of charter that we start engaging into a conversation as to the utility of section 33 moving forward fully recognizes it's a controversial topic. It's not easy to amend the constitution, uh, but I think it's important that we have this conversation so that we can really uh, uh, entrench and enhance and protect the rights of all Canadians for the next 40 years. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yasmin and Akfi. Um, I've got a, a group of questions I wanna add, uh, take us through as well. So um, I'll try and go through these uh, quickly, but, I, but they're also fairly weighty topics. Um, I, one of the questions that, that comes up uh, quite often is the different pieces of legislation that we have. And Professor Mathen, I'll ask you if you could outline for us the difference between the Bill of Rights, the Canadian Human Rights Act, and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and their relative uh, strengths and, and, and how they differ. Sure. So I will start at the top, if you will, uh, with the Charter, which is part of Canada's constitution. So we, we consider it part of our supreme law. And what that means is that every other law in Canada, which we call ordinary law, so laws that are passed by parliament or passed by a legislature of the province must be consistent with the charter. So it has to comply with the charter or the law will have no force and effect. And indeed a court can rule that the law is unconstitutional because of the charter. Um, the other important difference between the Charter and these other um, instruments that you've mentioned is that the Constitution is limited in terms of who it um, applies to, who is bound to obey the Charter. The state is bound to obey the Charter. So laws have to be consistent with the Charter and state actors must comply with the Charter, like police. Police are uh, governed by the Charter. But private individuals are not governed by the charter, right? So you can't, you know, if your neighbor prevents you from speaking at a block party, they haven't infringed your charter right of free expression. Or if someone steals your wallet, 
they haven't infringed your right against unreasonable search and seizure. There has to be this, the involvement of the state for the charter to be in play. And that's something that often is, is, uh, is, is not that well understood. The Canadian Bill of Rights was passed in 1960, and it contains many of the same rights that we um, see in the charter. We can see clear linkages, although as, as Jessica pointed out, there are also there were new rights inserted into the charter. The main difference between the Bill of Rights and the Canadian Charter is the Bill of Rights is an ordinary federal law. So it was passed by Parliament. It's not part of the Constitution. And because it's not part of the Constitution, the Canadian Bill of Rights is used to interpret other federal laws. It doesn't apply to provincial laws. And because it's not part of the Constitution, you can't strike down laws using the Bill of Rights. You can use it to interpret those federal laws to try and render them compatible, or ultimately a court could declare that there is an inconsistency. Uh, but you cannot use the Bill of Rights to, to strike down uh, other laws. And then the Canadian Human Rights Act, which is federal legislation, but we find comparators in all jurisdictions in Canada. So this is the web of human rights codes. Um, these are largely concerned with preventing discrimination in particular relationships. So employment relationships, services, accommodation, and, and, and so forth. Um, and it, the human rights regime applies to everybody. So it applies to the state. It also applies to private individuals to the extent that they are entering into certain uh, spheres of activity. Um, it is not part of the Constitution. So no human rights code is part of the Constitution. Um, the remedies that you get are they could be damages or you could get an order to the uh, offending party to stop the discrimination. But even though human rights codes are not part of the constitution, the courts have called them quasi-constitutional. This is a very interesting term. And the reason that they do that is because the underlying values of human rights codes, concerned as they are with non-discrimination, is so integral to the Canadian legal system. And indeed, there has been a lot of synergy between the interpretation of discrimination and equality from human rights codes, which existed before the charter, applied to the post-1982 jurisprudence where the court was having to deal with those concepts um, in the context of charter rights. Okay, and just to clarify, the Bill of Rights didn't cease to exist once the charter was, was passed. Uh, it is still in effect, it can still be pleaded, uh, and it is often uh, pleaded, but it's it's not as it doesn't have the same force. And the Supreme Court has also said that because they are so different, the the case law under the Bill of Rights does not uh, it does not have tremendous influence with respect to uh, the court's interpretation of the Charter of Rights. Okay, um, Jessica Law Thompson, I, I, I wonder if you could talk about Section 15 in our discussions in advance. Um, I think this was your second choice for talking about. I wonder if you could just uh, talk about the the importance in section 15 as as Catherine um, McKenney pointed out um, doesn't allow discrimination and then section 15 2 is kind of interesting because it allows for affirmative action type programs um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that uh, absolutely um, I think section 15 is interesting also in uh, it, to pick up on what Carissimo was just talking about about the role of the the human rights acts and human rights codes the network of those uh with it of, around in systems that are a little bit different in each province and territory and at the federal level um and the way that those are quasi-constitutional um there most of those human rights acts and human rights codes have a clause in them that sets out their paramountcy so although they uh, and, and the courts have have supported that paramountcy over over many decades and um, I think it's interesting to think about the um, potential law that's available to a Canadian who wants to um, wants to address an issue of discrimination to address an equality issue um, and to but to think about that in light of the actual possibilities of access to justice. Um, there are quite a few examples of um, uh, situations where 
uh, a particular right that might be protected under Human Rights Act has been able to be pushed forward further and faster within the courts, as opposed to the sort of administrative law system that's set up um, within with under Human Rights Acts. At the same time, in terms of access to justice uh, for for uh, for Canadians and for those who want to try to uh, seek protections against discrimination and harassment in the areas of housing, um, service services, uh, and the the areas that are covered by human rights acts, it's um, it's often easier and more accessible for somebody to do that and to 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 find to know their rights to learn what their rights are and to do something about it within the context of a human rights commission that can provide that information and support or provide mediation of a complaint um, as opposed to the system of the of going through the courts with the charter so they're two different systems and they they um, they run in parallel and they have there's there's pluses and minuses to either either approach when trying to achieve concrete lived differences in the reality of people who are seeking justice um, on the around equality rights um, it's a it, it it's it's always for me a question of access to justice um, I think that's the part that we really need to think about is the way that we make charter rights real for people in Canada the way that we make um, accessing and and seeking seeking justice under the charter available. Um, so programs like the Court Challenges program that has seen ups and downs in funding over the years all really um, come into play when we think about how we make rights real. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, the Court Challenges pro program plays a key role in making sure that people are able to get those rights. Otherwise, it's words on a piece of paper that that may not mean anything. Um, Lori Adelaide, I wonder if you could uh, share with us your thoughts about whether the Charter has worked well for Indigenous peoples um, and if you've got any any comments on, on Section 15. You weren't kidding about these weighty questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm not too sure if the if, if it has worked well for Indigenous people. Uh, the one good thing that it does is that it doesn't try to define that what the rights are, um, that it recognizes existing rights. And the Supreme Court um, has used Section 35, uh, has interpreted it in a way to uh, make sure that there are a range of uh, rights uh, to that we could uh, be guided by. And unfortunately, some of those cases like uh, RV Calder or RV Sparrow um, have been um, used, I think, um, to narrow um, rights that I think could have been interpreted in a more wider sense. I think that what Section 35 tries to do is um, create a space where um, there's this huge clash between two cultures, uh, between uh, the First Peoples of Canada and the settlers. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because of who uh, the Supreme Court judges have been historically, um, the interpretation of those range of rights have been more in the understanding of uh, those um, historical experiences of the settler uh, communities. So I think we still have a lot way to go. Uh, to ensure that we do better, to make sure that uh, we are um, recognizing existing rights. Um, I know that when I went to the University of Ottawa uh, as a law student, one of the 
wonderful experience that I've had to had was um, actually hear Yasser Natvi when he was the M MPP in Ontario uh, and to make sure that uh, uh, as a person who looks to uh, be guided by as a lawyer um, was to really try to understand how colonial laws uh, have uh, been created in Canada and how we could move towards maybe having more discussions about the use of Indigenous legal traditions um, within Canada. And I think that's something that I'm definitely hoping uh, to have more discussions as a parliamentarian uh, because uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit do still have laws uh, that we've used uh, since time immemorial and um, we're still not able to interpret them uh, within the realm of Section 35 and I, I think that's something that uh, I hope more uh, conversations will occur as we continue to see more uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit lawyers um, become uh, people becoming lawyers and uh, practicing law and challenging uh, the space that I think uh, could do a better job of, of incorporating Indigenous laws within our systems. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, sir, I, I want to come back to um, uh, Councillor McKinney in a minute, but, but first, if I can just ask Yasser Nakhli if you can comment on what Laurie Edelag was, was talking about, and especially in your role as, as Attorney General, how are Attorneys General able to advance um, that understanding of Indigenous law and the rights of Indigenous people using the Charter or other instruments? Um, thank you, um, and, and Laurie, thank you for, for your kindness. It's, it's, it's remarkable to be able to now serve with Laurie um, and, and learn from her wisdom. Uh, I have to tell all of you that when Laurie stands up in the house and she asks a question or speaks on an issue, the place goes quiet, uh, which is quite telling for a place like House of Commons, which is usually not a quiet chamber. So Laurie, thank you for, for your wisdom and, and enriching all of us. Um, you, you know, as, as Andrew, you mentioned, I had the, the great honor of serving uh, as an attorney general in, in the province of Ontario uh, now uh, some years ago. Um, and we as a conversation were starting to really meaningfully, uh, um, as a policy uh, matter, uh, were starting to bring the issue of how whatever policy proposal we are putting forward interacts with our um, obligations under the constitution to, and as part of reconciliation with the indigenous peoples. So one of the things that Ontario did in the Ministry of Attorney General, we were the first uh, uh, jurisdiction in the country that created an indigenous law division, uh, a standalone department within the Ministry of Attorney General with a associate deputy minister and an entire team, indigenous team, uh, lawyers of indigenous uh, background to give us advice. And just like uh, for any uh, regulatory policy or legal issue, we would get charter or constitutional uh, opinion as to whether it's constitutional or not. We would also ensure that we would it would go through an analysis to the indigenous law division to ensure that we are meeting our treaty obligations that it is actually furthering uh, uh, the, the 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 key of the tenants around re reconciliation uh, so that was i thought was a very important work that we were doing i understand it has now been replicated across the country uh, country including the federal level um, so that we can give uh, treaty rights indigenous rights uh, the process of reconciliation equal standing as everything else when we are uh, looking at and developing uh, our laws that was one thing the other thing uh, which was challenging at times i would admit is looking at litigation vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples and indigenous communities and making a decision whether we will engage in that litigation or not. 
And, you know, the lawyers will tell you, well, it's, there's a very important legal principle. And if we don't engage in this legal principle, we will be setting bad precedent or, or we will not correct this. And, and as the attorney general who gets to sign off, especially at an appellate level on those matters, uh, that was, that was um, very intense conversations. Because where do you then find that balance between precedent setting, which, which, is, which is the common law, which is, which is colonial law that we have adopted uh, because it was brought by, by the colonizers uh, versus indigenous uh, uh, laws, uh, indigenous treaty obligations. And so, so that was another um, element that, uh, that, had to be, that had to be taken into account. I will just make the last point that with the uh, with the adoption of uh, the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and that law coming into place, that is actually creates a, a very important framework, uh, both for federal government and provincial territorial governments to actually reconcile some of those differences because that's an obligation now a treaty of uh, uh, international treaty obligation that we must comply with uh, and ensure that indigenous rights. Are, are given paramountcy. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm sorry to be rushing people along. Uh, and Andrew, I may have to leave because I have to go to the Human Rights Committee, <laughs> speaking okay. of human rights. <laughs> if people have to leave, okay. Uh, uh, Professor Masson, I just want to get a quick word from you uh, on, on your thoughts about Indigenous rights and, and, and the Charter. Well, I, I, I do want to just clarify that, because it's important that the indigenous rights that are protected by the constitution are not actually technically part of the charter and the reason that's important is for example they're not subject to the notwithstanding clause right so and 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 they're not they don't have the you don't have section one uh, th there is a a, a a set of judicially interpreted limits but uh, i think that the the place of indigenous rights in the canadian constitutional framework is incredibly important it is an evolving state of the law I think we have new and, and challenges. Uh, I think the relationship between UNDRIP and the Canadian constitutional, the Canadian constitution as judges and lawyers see it is something that's going to be challenged. And uh, I, the, the road ahead is not going to be a smooth one, but I think it's a, it's a very necessary one. Okay, thank you. I know you've got to go to a class. Yes or not, you're leaving. We will end exactly at one, but if anybody has to leave, um, um, we, we'll understand that. Um, thank you for your patience, Councillor McKinney. Uh, your thoughts on the discussion we've had we've had so far? Well, again, I'm going to go back. I'm going to fall back on the fact that I'm neither a lawyer nor a constitutional expert in, in, you in me. any way. <laughs> I'm a politician. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, you know, just recently in, in Ottawa, uh, as many of you know, we were at Challenge um, with... Um, an illegal mm -hmm. occupation, really, um, uh, and uh, you know, an illegal protest uh, that resulted in uh, 28 days of, um, of reasonable limits being, uh, you know, being um, overtaken by a group of people who felt that they had uh, a right to come in and protest, um, and it was uh, it was a, a very interesting. Um, uh, evolution of, of thinking that, you know, as, as, as this began, I mean, we can go all the way back to mask mandates and vaccine mandates and the right to keep people uh, healthy and, you know, collectively, collective public health. But as the convoy and, uh, you know, as it, as it rolled into Ottawa, uh, many of us made statements, myself included, that, you know, I defended uh, the right to protest. Uh, ask for them to come peacefully, uh, respectfully, or not at all. Um, they came, they were not respectful, they were not peaceful, uh, but they came anyway. And, you know, the, the, the conversation quickly turned to, um, you know, the, the rights of, of large vehicles <laughs> to come into a uh, city and park, as opposed to people coming into and onto the hill, uh, Parliament Hill, to to protest uh, against, in this case, what was um, apparently a vaccine mandate. Um, 
But in this case, you know, the, the rights uh, that were set out that were argued for by, um, by the occupied people who occupied the city, um, you know, they just didn't recognize that they, they had to be subjected to uh, reasonable limits. And those reasonable limits, of course, uh, were um, the, the peace, the, the safety um, of people who actually live in a city. And, uh, and um, you know, it was, uh, it, it quickly became evident that, uh, that the rights of people to, um, you know, to, to their own personal security and safety had been overridden and it, and it became um, evident very quickly how quick that could happen and what the um, downward spiral of, um, you know, uh, not understanding and not, um, not putting in place the, you know, the, the, the protections that we needed against this type of occupation. Th thank you. You've also actually answered one of the questions that, that, that came in just about that. I mean, you've got chart of rights. Should people also have responsibilities? And of course. Yeah. Um, uh, Jessica Law Thompson, a, a couple of questions here. One, if you could just clarify for our audience. Um, in terms of uh, the rights of uh, uh, persons with disabilities, um, are, are those sufficiently, in your view, uh, protected with Section 15? Um, I think that Section 15 uh, provides, um, provides protections but I think as we've seen in the recent years and the attempts to develop um, federal legislation for the protection of uh, the rights of persons with disabilities across Canada um, and the work that's happened at the federal level uh, trying to um, create, create more comprehensive uh, and detailed and actionable um, legislation that can protect people's rights. Um, the Charter, while it is a powerful and important quasi-constitutional document, isn't meaningfully accessible for many uh, people who are facing um, challenges in terms of wanting to challenge the law uh, under Section 15. It's very, very difficult for somebody. Um, the layers of vulnerability and um, uh, marginalization or um, ability to access um, persons with disability are more likely to be living in poverty, for example, more likely to be facing um, a range of uh, economic and social disadvantages that make access to justice more difficult. So I think that we can look at charter rights as um, as vital, as important, as, as the kind of foundations, as the the core structure that our other legal systems that we have in, in Canada are built on, but that fundamentally accessing rights um, in a meaningful way, particularly for persons with disability, there needs to be more. There needs to be, um, uh, there's legislation in the US, for example, the Americans with Disabilities Act that provides much broader and more comprehensive um, protections than anything we have in Canada. Um, the patchwork of different um, protections and 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 opportunities for legal recourse, I think, is uh, is a key issue for persons with disability. Um, so, and, and, so yeah, that that would be sort of an okay. initial thought. Yeah, uh, and what are your thoughts about uh, trans rights that Councillor McKenney had talked about not being um, secured under Section 28? To what extent are they secured under Section 15? Um, so the courts have uh, have 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 interpreted Section 15 um, and have have provided um, have provided guidance. There's also, I think, a lot of changes that have happened in the last 10 years or so, where jurisdictions all across Canada have finally added gender as a protected ground under their Human Rights Acts. We now have. Um, and, and that was something I, I was involved with during my time as director of the Yukon Human Rights Commission um, and, and also during my time in Nunavut as a member of the 
Nunavut Human Rights Tribunal, where um, there were um, miles, significant milestones that took place um, in terms of the advancement of gender protections um, for human, human rights protections in Canada. Um, the text of the charter has been interpreted by case law. And I think that's one really important thing to think about. Every time when we when we read um, the text of the charter, the charter is like all law in Canada, a living thing. It's a it's a we we have um, the the common law that is a, a growing and living and constantly changing um, um, uh, way of of experiencing law and of building a legal rule of law, a society that's governed by the rule of law, um, that's able to be purposive, it's able to change and it's able to move um, as society moves and changes. So um, I think that's one important thing to to think about when looking at the 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 words as they're written exactly in the charter is that many of the sections have seen enormous amounts of um, complex legal um, elucidation. Uh, more threads have been woven woven on to those skeletons, and sometimes the meaning of the of the uh, or the scope perhaps of um, something that lawyers like to call uh, uh, like a basket clause where you've got sort of a list of things and and others like it. The and others like it at the end of that list often is what's interpreted uh, by case law. And I think that's where really the gender protections, um, then the, the major change that we've seen in terms of protections around gender and human rights have taken place is actually um, at the tribunal level and and at the at, at the level uh, uh, within 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 court decisions, and then yeah. also that major change of having, of having gender added to provincial, territorial, and and the federal human rights act. Okay, we we are pretty much out of time, but I'll ask you each for 30 seconds uh, just to talk about uh, whether you whether you think the charter is, is understood well enough, and what we as a, as a country should be doing to increase the the understanding of the charter. And I'll ask uh, Councillor McKinney first. You know, very quickly, I I don't think it always is. I think that there is misunderstanding as to you know uh, exactly what it addresses and and who it gives authority to, um, and we see that we see that often, and we see the the confusion often as well between tribunal, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, Criminal Code. You know, as Jessica just pointed out, certainly not wrong. Like that, you know. Uh, there, there is, um, you know, the, there is precedence in terms of protections under under gender, uh, even though it doesn't, it's not specific to Section 28. Um, you know, so I think that's always evolving. Um, do I think it ever will be completely understood? You know, again, I, I, it, that's for lawyer. <laughs> like, like there's just such, a, um, you know, there's just such a. I think people put a, a lot in that basket of of uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, I think we're so lucky to have it as uh, as a country, and that's why people do that. Will we ever fully understand it? Not likely, but we could probably do more. And, and I think you are today, Andrew, in, in you know in, in this type of uh, forum. Yeah, well, and th thank you for being part of it, uh, Jessica Law Thompson. Your your last thought about where we go with the understanding of the charter. Well, um, Andrea and, and Catherine, I think in many ways, um, you know, where I'd like to leave us is is recognizing that the work of the Charter um, and the work of building a democratic uh, country that's that's foundations are rights and freedoms is work that has been has gone on and and that we are we're sort of standing on the on the shoulders of of, of giants, right? We we have uh, we have many generations of uh, of of lawyers, of activists, of citizens, of of rights holders, of people who have uh, come together and tied tied us all, bound us with uh, with their their um, their compassionate desire for a country that 
um, can pro can provide that uh, make that peace peace order and good government, but make it real in terms of rights and freedoms that we enjoy. So just to to think about uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and um, uh, uh, yeah. Yasser Nakbi was mentioning Section 27 around multiculturalism. It was Paul yes. Paul Yuzik and um, uh, Anthony Linka, who were members of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, who who were were leaders in in the development of that multicultural section, multiculturalism section, um, and so so many decades and so many people, so I have 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 um, contributed to um, to what we have now, and so just kind of leave us with that thought that each generation needs to needs to play our part and to weave our own threads in. Um, but that we're not alone. We're we're standing we're standing with our with the generations that came before us, um, who've brought us to where we are now. Yeah, and I I just want to add in terms of uh, Ukrainian Canadians, you remind me of uh, the great Lawrence Decor, uh, who who chaired the Multicultural Advisory Committee uh, to the federal government at the time of the Charter and very heavily lobbied for Section 27 to be included, whereas it wasn't included uh, in the first uh, in in the first iteration. So uh, yeah, in in terms of uh, and it just reminds us um, of the 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 terrible juxtaposition of what's happening in Ukraine, and yet what uh, what uh, what incredible leadership uh, Ukrainian Canadians have provided in Canada in many ways. Uh, so thank you for your work, and as we as we do uh, stop and think about rights and uh, think about what's happening in Ukraine these days. I, I want to thank um, you, uh, Catherine McKenney and and uh, Jessica La Thompson for staying to the bitter end um, of the good end. Uh, also, thanks to Yasser Nakri, Professor Kit Karisma Mathen, and uh, um, and Laurie Idloud uh, for mm -hmm. for joining us today. This is an incredibly complex and profound topic. We decided to have this event today, uh, the first of of April, because the the 40th anniversary is actually on the 17th of April, and we hope. By by raising uh, awareness of the of this anniversary, which we'll be doing through through posting this webinar and its various parts on social media and on our YouTube channel, um, that people will think about this over the months. The 17th happens to be Easter Sunday, so people may not be thinking about the 40th anniversary. But I hope that this is a month that we'll all uh, take some time at least to think about this um, this incredible document that we as Canadians are so proud of. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for joining us, and again. Catherine McKenney and uh, Jessica Law Thompson. Thank you. Wonderful having you here today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew.